Hello there and welcome to Revelation TV, the Q&A show with me, Cyrus Fernando. Maybe it's your first time watching Christian television or Revelation TV, or maybe it's your first time watching the Q&A show. This program is live and interactive, and it's all about our viewers. So if you've got any questions on creation science, on the Bible, on scriptures, or any interpretation of that, then please do write in tonight and uh, we'd love to answer your questions. The details are on screen live at revelationtv.com is the email address and SMS details are right there. And uh, to answer your question tonight, we're privileged to have Dr. Grady McMurtry <laughs> live in the studio. How are you doing? Thank you, sir. May I, may I say you look even better in person? Oh, God bless you. No, you <laughs> and you are as intelligent as you are in person as well. May I say that, Grady? You may. <laughs> I just did. <laughs> Good. Grady, um, it's so wonderful to have you with us um, in Spain, in the studio. We've done a few programs together. It's been an absolute privilege. Uh, you've got to meet a lot of our team members as well, us in this new building, this wonderful yes, building. Wonderful as well. new building. Wonderful new building. What do you make out of it? What were your impressions when you arrived? Well, I just remember when it was a piece of dirt, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and what's, what's been happening since then, I think it's marvelous. You know, the Lord has really blessed you uh, through, the, through, through the viewers. Yeah. Uh, but God always uses the viewer's hands that's extended to accomplish his work on earth. And so this is a fruit of that. It's a miracle. It truly is a miracle. And it's the wonderful viewers who have supported this vision of, of Howard's vision to have our own studios. And uh, look where we are today. And uh, we thank to our viewers. And also thanks for God's grace having his hands over this building and, and everything and all the blessings that's going to come through it. And we pray right. that we can reach out to more people. And you've seen fruit come already. Mm. I mean, you haven't even had the grand opening just yet, but it's yeah. already bearing fruit. Amen to that. Thank you so much, Grady. Now, Grady, there's an article I'd love to cover with you tonight uh, just before we start the program. But in the meantime, send us your email live at revelationtv.com. SMS details are on screen. Grady, there is a revival going on in the United States. 20,000 people uh, join Asbury Revival on University Campus. They're attending the revival service at the University of Asbury. This has happened in the small town in the state of Kentucky, USA, which normally has a population of 6,000 people. With five overflowing buildings and a grass lawn filled with people, Desperate to worship and glorify Jesus Christ, Asbury President Kevin Brown posted a message on social media saying, whether you call this a revival, a renewal, an awakening or an outpouring, we have experienced on our campus these last few weeks is unlike anything I've ever seen in my entire life. And Brown said also, people are hungry and they are hungry for something more. Quoting Jesus in the New Testament, Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The impact has been so powerful that its ongoing spirit-led event has drawn the attention of major media outlets. It's also drawing a wider worldwide audience, particularly of young people, to witness what is happening through the hands at first accounts of photography, videos, and everything. All the posts are now also going viral as well. They've been streaming this Grady online on social media as well. But it's powerful to see these young people on a university campus worshipping and praising God. We're seeing this revival. What are your thoughts on this? Well, it's my fact that I talked to my wife about it. Um, and what you didn't mention that she shared with me was that there have been some healings there. Amen. Uh, but what particularly strikes me, uh, of course, not to negate the healing, but uh, there are reports of students who uh, have been at this revival and have matured 20 years in their Bible knowledge wow. in only just the attendance of this. I, I mean, they're, well, but, they're, you know, they're, they are speaking as if they had done far more studies that if they were casual students, suddenly they are like they were in-depth students. Wow. And so there's definitely a move of the Holy Spirit there. That is absolutely powerful. Now, give us an insight into, we, we know what Christianity is like in the United Kingdom. You could say we're no longer a Christian nation. Um, you could say we're taking Jesus out of our schools, out of our governments and such things. What out is of your state, church. Out of our church <laughs> as well, Grady. What is the state of Christianity in the United States? It's better. It, it, it needs renewal as well. Um, today we talk about having less than 50% of the population actually being genuine Christian churchgoers and so on. Um, but we have a lot more freedom of religion. We still have 
uh, people that are very active in the Christian community. We still have soul winning going on. Um, you know, the, the move of the Holy Spirit at Asbury uh, has been very dramatic. Uh, however, it isn't the only place where the Holy Spirit's moving. And there have been visits by students, for instance, in other colleges, for instance, Lee College, uh, which is in the East Tennessee area. Um, it's only a couple hundred miles from Asbury at most. Um, and they visit and they've taken it back. There's been some fires set in other seminaries, other colleges, Christian colleges. So don't know how far it's going to go. How would you deter, how would you define the word revival? What is your your explanation of that? Well, to to me at least, in the word of revival is that people know a lot about Christianity in the United States, but not necessarily Christians. You know, when I was growing up in the 1950s and 60s, it would be impossible not to know things about Christianity. You know, Jesus, yeah. Mother Mary, Joseph. Uh, the idea of his life, death, burial, resurrection were common knowledge. Mm. Um, even though I wasn't a Christian, didn't become a Christian until I was 27, it was common knowledge. Today, the vast amount of the population are ignorant of Christianity. Why is that? Where, where did things change? How did things change? Well, if I may get particularly specific about it, Christians, they sow the seed of their own destruction. Okay. And they do that because we are tolerant. You know, we, we, we serve a God who is absolutely just, but absolutely loving at the same time. Mm. And so because he is absolutely loving, uh, we don't try to force people to believe. We share with them. We want them to believe. Uh, we explain the justice of God, His laws, rules, roles, standards of conduct, purpose in our lives. And without Christianity, people really can't have purpose in their lives. Um, however, we don't make them do it, right? But we're looking at the world that we're living in. It's a lost world. People are, we're talking about the statistics of mental health, people suicidal, so many issues and problems that people are experiencing every single day. Surely this is time more than ever where the world needs Jesus Christ. And I agree with you, but the single biggest problem of the church universe, wherever in the world, mm -hmm. that, that the Christian church exists, mm -hmm. the single biggest problem is apathy. Mm -hmm. And so while we have Christians that are certainly very active, you know, you're familiar with that 80-20 rule, you know, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Yeah. Well, the same thing is true of evangelism. And so revival is because people have lost their first love and in Asbury's revival, as we'll call it, we see people that uh, have all of a sudden, as you say, become thirsty again. Mm. And so revival is becoming thirsty again and wanting to be with the Lord, whereas it has become too casual. It's something that, oh, I've got all the rest of this stuff to do, gets put on the back burner, as we say. Yes. Um, and so we really need to rekindle within the Christian community that desire to be with God, regardless of denomination, regardless of location. But how do we do that? Well, again, of course, from my perspective, I once I became a Christian, I've never experienced a need for revival because I was always there in the yes, moment. You know? yes. But for those that, and, and by the way, King David talks about this, is restoring to me my first love you know, for the Lord. Um, and so, again, you've got to make a decision. That's important. Mm. You've got to make a decision. It's not going to come by simply letting it just some another come out of your pocket. Mm. So you've got to make the decision. You've got to get back involved in church because mm. we're not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together. You've got to get back into Bible reading, possibly prayer groups. It's, it's, you've got to become active in your Christian faith to start with. Can I say, so with due respect, you're in the ministry, you're surrounded yes. yourself by Christians. Yeah. What about those people watching us tonight who maybe they're in the secular world, they're working with people who are of various different other religions as well. For them to find that way of drawing closer to God might be more difficult for someone who's already surrounding themselves in God during their ministry, ministry work to a certain extent. But that's when you have to make the time exactly. to get out of the secular world, mm. even if it's just one hour a day yeah. for your own personal renewal, yes. which then leads to personal revival. Amen. Amen.
Perfect. Well, that's been very interesting from my perspective, and I'm sure it has been for you. And thank you so much, Grady, oh, for uh, sharing that. And I just want to encourage any new viewers who are watching us. We've recently launched on Freeview Channel 281, and, um, and we know there's a lot of people watching us on Freeview. Maybe it's your first time watching Revelation TV, or maybe you watch us every week, but you've never written in. There was a post I saw on social media that we put a post up with uh, to say that we're going to be on tonight together in the studio. And so many people were commenting, and I was looking at the names <laughs> on, the, on the people who were commenting on social media, and I don't recognize any of those names. And I'm sure we get so many people who watch the program and they've never written in. Well, tonight is your night and I really want to encourage you. Tonight can be your first time writing in. Please do uh, write in. No matter how small or simple your question is, we welcome all types of questions. And if it is your first time writing in, then please do say that uh, in your email. Let's go through the emails, Grade, if we can. Jerry's from uh, Watford and he's written and say, Hi, greetings and blessings to you both. Could you please ask Dr. Grady for a scripture verses about the Holy Spirit? only drawing someone a few times before stopping forever? Well, I have actually met, I think that they've watched before, and I've said something to that effect previously in other programs, okay? okay. But the scripture reference there is the one about, you know, we're not to, and it depends on your translation, we're not to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Um, that's one prominent translation. Um, Another, you know, taking the Lord in vain and you think of blaspheming. But if that were the situation where you're not to blaspheme the name of the Lord, I don't know if any of us would get to heaven. Mm -hmm. You know, because at some point in our lives we probably have. But to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, what does it really mean? Um, the Bible is very clear about this. No one comes to faith unless the Holy Spirit draws them. That's a scriptural basis. The problem is we don't know how many times in a person's life the Holy Spirit might draw an individual person because there's no, no, nothing in the Bible that says, oh, he's going to come five times, he's going to come nine times. Um, so each individual is different. But the Holy Spirit draws you. Maybe you're a child, you're six years old, uh, you're at a children's you know, vacation Bible school perhaps. And the Holy Spirit's drawing you and you have the opportunity to become saved and yet you say, no, not now. And the Holy Spirit is a gentleman and so he goes away. And again, later on, perhaps you're at a youth meeting when you're 17 and there's an opportunity for you to, to be saved, become a Christian, and the Holy Spirit is drawing you. You know he's drawing you and yet you still intentionally reject and say, no, not now. And again, it might happen at 24 and 38 and 52 and so forth. But there comes a point in time when the Holy Spirit draws you for the last time and you say no, whether that's one person the fifth time or another person the ninth time. But that last time you say no, and the Holy Spirit says, okay, have a nice life, but I'm never coming back. And if he doesn't come back, you'll never be drawn. And if you're not drawn, you'll never get saved. So you condemn yourself. And so it starts with that concept of what is really the blasphemy. It's not taking the Lord's name in vain. It's saying no to the Holy Spirit each time He draws you and the final time because you then condemn yourself. Okay. This next one's from Jean in, uh, in Kent and she's saying, this is my first email into a program. So <laughs> welcome, Jean. Welcome. Thank you so much. And it's great <laughs> to have you along with us tonight. And it says, uh, I would like to hear your views on the following two questions, please. Uh, number one, as the, world's, as the world watched news pictures of the tanks lined up on the Russian border with the rhetoric coming out of Russia, this is a training exercise. Were the world's governments really that gullible to believe this and so hesitant to think Putin would not attack Ukraine? What do you think about that? Unfortunately, I think there are people who actually thought it was a training exercise that he wouldn't. But I think that any knowledgeable person of the area, I've been going to Russia for 25 years. When he puts tanks on the border, he has every intention to go across the border. And any rational, reasonable person who knows anything about geopolitics would know that. Mm. She's also saying, asking myself, just watching these images, strongly think Ukraine must have been fast-tracked into, uh, should be, sorry, fast-tracked into NATO at that time before the invasion. Uh, not a hindsight thought. I was saying this to the family then. Do you agree? Also, would it not be too late now in light of America and many countries pledging support for the duration? I think surely 
it would have meant Russia hesitating and realizing the NATO would be the force to reckon uh, probably different outcome. Instead of a year on, we have devastation, Ukraine people, displacement, world economies, economies affected by the events, huge financial aid to the war effort and still ongoing tension. Thank you in advance, Gene. There was a peace treaty that could have been signed before this happened and uh, the, the death and destruction did not have to happen. And I hate to say this, but I'm going to put it at the feet of liberal politicians who vetoed it. But uh, there was a plan in place that could have been signed and prevented all this. And I think there's a misconception about Ukraine joining NATO and preventing all this. Uh, I don't think that's the situation at all. Um, when you take a look at what the political situation was at the time, you have to realize that Putin thinks that he is the one that will resurrect what was the Soviet Union. And he wants to therefore bring back the sphere of influence of the USSR. He wants to take the land back, he wants to take the people back that broke away at the time of the walls falling. And he sees himself as the one to do that. So he fully intended to go into Ukraine. But his real problem was that if I can make a, an analogy to Khrushchev and the Cuban Missile pro problem that we had back in the 60s with JFK, um, because we were talking about sending missiles into stationing them in the Ukraine that would have been able to hit Moscow in literally a matter of minutes. Mm. And so he's looking at, I don't want missiles in the Ukraine. Mm. That's the number one issue. Mm -hmm. So it was a part of national security from his viewpoint. Now, I'm not saying that I like Putin. I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't like his motives, etc. I wish he hadn't invaded the Ukraine. But he's looking at it from his viewpoint, and you've got to at least understand what that was. So he didn't want NATO mm -hmm. to be in Ukraine. He didn't want missiles to be put in Ukraine. And so in order to fulfill what he thinks is his calling, uh, he went into the Ukraine. Now, the Crimea is something that is a totally different issue. The Crimea was never part of the Ukraine to begin with. That was a separate thing. And all he did was take back part of Russia that was Russia. But going over the border into Ukraine proper, um, if we had simply agreed that we aren't going to put missiles in Ukraine, if we'd agreed that NATO wouldn't be a part of Ukraine, that Ukraine would be basically neutral, uh, we could have gotten a peace agreement right then and there. Can I ask you the, the reaction of the US people? Because in, in the United Kingdom, for example, I think people had a lot of compassion for the Ukrainians of going through devastating of losing their homes and such things and then we brought some um, some of the Ukrainians into Britain and we housed them and such things oh, yes. and then we started to see that the economy starts to become affected we started to see the people's prices and the petrol and such things people's opinions then changed Grady and people became less passionate and caring towards the Ukrainian people and what was going on there as well had things changed in any way in the states in the states absolutely side? i mean it's the same thing basically um of course surprisingly biden went to the ukraine and said oh we're going to send another 500 million dollars mm. it's a very unpopular thing because we have in effect by arming ukraine disarmed the united states the yes. same thing has happened in the uk yes you have effectively disarmed the uk to try to support now it's always better to fight a war in somebody else's land. Mm -hmm. You know, I commend the Ukrainians and, and I have friends there. I have friends on both sides, mm -hmm. both in Ukraine and Russia. Mm -hmm. I helped to start a Genesis Institute in Kyiv. I've been going there since the 90s. Um, and so I'm very concerned about the friends that I have and what they're having to go through. Let me ask you, the friends that you have on the the Russian side, they're informed, they're well informed. I assume they understand what's going on. What are their thoughts of what's going on in Russia, between Russia and Ukraine? Well, the, the Russian people in general don't like it. And, and the, the I won't say necessarily the, the majority, although I think it's becoming the majority in the United States, don't like our, our way of doing this. Mm. Um, you know, you, you cannot win a war by bankrupting yourself. Mm. 
And so the people are really not supporting this. The funny thing is, it's the liberals that want this to be done, mm. not the conservatives. Okay, John's, uh, John's written an email here, Grady. Is the gift of instantly speaking in uh, other known languages or tongues still in operation today? This was called the great Pentecostal failure of the 19th century when missionaries found that they had to study to learn foreign languages instead of the book of Acts. That's from John. <laughs> Do you know anything about that, Grady? Well, I would point out that I think that that is still active today. However, um, it's a practical matter. God doesn't just give a missionary a language. After all, I work on five continents myself, and God doesn't necessarily give you a language and then tells you to go. He says, go and learn the language. Mm. <laughs> and this is true, for instance, of, say, New Tribes Missions. Now, they're very close to where I live in terms of their headquarters in Florida. And again, they don't start with John 3.16. They start with Genesis chapter 1. Because unless you can learn the language, explain to people the story of creation recently as recorded in the Bible, then there really isn't any gospel to share. Mm. John 3, 16 doesn't make any sense unless you accept Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Interesting. Uh, John's written in to say, good evening. Um, as Rachel had already died, please can you interpret Joseph's dream? Was it that the sun in Pharaoh um, and the moon in the cup bearer and the stars are 11 years in prison? I know these are different interpretations. I'm afraid I'm a little confused by the question. I think I am a little bit. <laughs> so I wonder if you can slightly clarify that for us, please, uh, John, if you don't mind. Uh, this next one's from Cynthia, John 14, verse 6. A well-known verse we all know. Uh, no one comes to the Father except through me. There is a lot of contra uh, controversy about this verse. Even I can struggle at times. Why do people say that they have seen God when the above verse says no one? And some Christians say Jesus is God. Well, Jesus is God. And that's why he says no one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, that verse is very near and dear to me, and I teach on it with great frequency. Uh, when I became a Christian, it was because I was in a search for truth. And in that search for truth, I came to realize that truth is not a concept. Truth is a person. And in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the truth. That truth is a person, not a concept. So this verse is very near and dear to me personally. Now, no one has seen the Father God. However, they have seen in the past the Son as he was walking on the earth 2,000 years ago. And so Jesus was incarnate, visible to those that he was able to contact at that time. So the verses are not contradictory. The Father has never been seen. The Father's never left heaven. Uh, the Father is spirit. Uh, after all, the Bible says you must worship him in spirit and in truth, correct? However, Jesus the Son has been seen. And I mentioned the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit does not draw you, you cannot be saved because the Holy Spirit draws you and then points you to Jesus. And then Jesus is the one you rely upon for your salvation. And so nothing we've said tonight would contradict that. Okay, Mark's written in to say, Good evening, Dr. Grady and Cy. If, by, if by, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, in Galatians 2.16, and the justification by faith in Jesus wasn't available to the children of Israel, how did God decide who would go to torment in Hades and who would go to Abraham's bosom uh, in the Old Testament times, e.g. Lazarus and the rich man? And what about the Gentiles before Jesus? How was their eternal destiny decided? Well, there's really two parts to the answer to that question. Uh, number one, uh, Paul tells us that those who have never actually been exposed to the gospel will be judged by a righteous, loving God, and that they will be judged according to what they knew. That we can see laws of God by simply looking at nature. And so that's the part about those who have never been exposed to the gospel. Now, if you'll read the book of Hebrews and the great faith chapter, you'll notice it says that they were saved by faith, looking ahead to the coming of the Messiah. And that was accounted unto them as righteousness, such as Abraham, Moses, 
Noah, and that they went to a place called Paradise. Uh, we might sort of think of this as like a warehouse for the Old Testament saints that existed for 4,000 years. And remember, Jesus said to one thief who became a Christian on the cross, you will be with me this day in paradise. That when they died, Jesus and the one thief went to paradise and were there for two and a half days. And when Jesus rose on the third day on Sunday, he actually took paradise from what was part of the underworld, not a bad place, it was a good place, but he took it from the underworld because you can't go to heaven until after the resurrection. And he transferred paradise and the Old Testament saints to heaven, except for some who stopped in Jerusalem, walked the streets glorifying God for a time. And they were his first fruits offering to the Father. And so, yes, they were saved by faith, by the faith that they knew, by the revelation that they knew. So the revelation, let's say, of Moses was superior to the revelation of Job, but Job gave all the sacrifices, uh, as he says, I've done it all correctly, and that God would account that unto him for righteousness. Uh, but as we go through, David had more revelation of God than Moses. Because over 4,000 years, God was continuously revealing new things about himself through the prophets and the writings until the time of Jesus. And that's why there's nothing more to add because once the Son had come and verbally shared and lived and given an example to us, there's nothing more to say. Mm. Okay. We got 27 minutes of the program, Grady, but I've got so many emails coming in. It's unbelievable. So thank you all to our viewers for writing. And I'm going to do my very, very hardest to get through these emails. Uh, Paulette and Ken has just written in to say, hi, Dr. Grady and Cy. Just want to say how much we're enjoying you live in the studio. Blessings from Paul and Ken. That's very yeah, kind I'm, words. I'm enjoying it very much too. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Uh, this next one's from Anthony saying, "Is there any? are there any different rewards in heaven according to how we have been faithful? Not works, may I add. Then we will see and abode um, with our saved family and friends who have different rewards. So rewards in heaven. Yes, there are. Right. And this is mentioned in various ways. First of all, you can think about the parables of the master who gave his servants various talents, one, two, one, five, one, ten. He goes away for a long period of time, and when he comes back, there's an accounting. And so the one that doubled was rewarded, the one, whether it was two or five or ten, but if they were faithful and worked hard and increased the kingdom, then the master blessed them. And also then in the book of Revelation and other places in the New Testament, Paul talks about crowns. Now in reading the Bible, we can discern seven different crowns, the crown of righteousness, and there are others. So there are differences of reward, but there's no difference in salvation, uh -huh. wow. right? Very good. So regardless of your reward, there's no difference in salvation, but those who have been more faithful more productive, uh, wisely uses of the resources God has given to them, they will be rewarded. Remember, one will be over a small number of people, but others will be over a large number of people. Mm. So there's differences in reward, but there's absolutely no difference in salvation. Very, very good. Les has written into asking about creation. Do you think it makes any difference whether or not a Christian believes in a young or old earth creation, Grady? I've stipulated on the program many times you can believe in an old earth and you can go to heaven because it's not the salvation issue. The salvation issue is your relationship with the Father through the Son. However, if you do believe in an old earth, whether you realize it or not, you are negating the power of the cross. If the earth were old and life and death had been going on for millions and billions of supposed years, then when we take a look at Romans chapter 5, Paul says that it is only through the sin of the first man, Adam, 6,000 years ago, that death of a nefesh organism came into the universe. And so, again, if, if Adam's sin did not cause death, then death is common. If death is common, then the death of Christ on the cross is meaningless. It's just another death. The only thing that makes the death of Christ truly significant is that because the first perfect man, Adam, then sinned, and the entire universe became imperfect at that point, 
and has become more and more imperfect since. But it is only because of the sin of the first man, Adam, that brought death in the earth. Then and only then can you understand how the death of the second Adam, as he's referred to, Jesus Christ, can atone for that sin. And so if you believe in an old earth, you have, unfortunately, a weak faith. Um, you lack knowledge of the evidence scientifically for a young earth, as well as a lack of believing in biblical inerrancy. But it will not cause you to not go to heaven, but it does negate the power of the cross in your witness. Thank you very much, Dr. Grady, for that. Um, this next one's from Joy. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. I'm so sorry to see how many human beings are treating God's earth. I know because of Adam's sin, the earth was cursed in Genesis, but it is still our beautiful home and we are all meant to look after the earth. Dr. Grady, how much is all the bombings affecting our fragile earth and the environment today. Each bomb must have a negative effect. And she says, shh, you're both my favorites. That's from Joy. <laughs> That's sweet. Well, thank you, Joy. And we like your name, too. <laughs> I want to make a very big difference here. There are those people who are environmental terrorists. They are not Christians. They are very secular. They have a religion uh, called secular humanism. Um, and they are trying to protect the earth as they see it, because they consider the earth to be their god. It's the god Gaia from the ancient religions. Um, however, God does call us to be Christian conservatives and conservationists. And so we are to wisely use the resources that are given to us. That's the creation mandate given to us in Genesis chapter 1. And so we shouldn't waste, we shouldn't haste. Uh, war always is destructive, not only of man-made structures, but again, it can contaminate the earth uh, in terms of the farming and so on. And the recent train derailment uh, in Ohio, for instance, in the States, is terrible. And people are not trying to clean it up properly at all. Right. And I'm going to say that that's an indictment of our government not taking care of the problem. But we aren't to worship the earth. We are not to be motivated by this environmental terrorist idea of reducing population because we're a cancer on the land. But we are to be wise stewards of the resources God has given to us. So I'm a Christian conservationist, but I am not an environmental terrorist. And there's a big difference between the two. Thank you, Grady, for that. Linda's written in to say, Hi, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. I've heard recently that John 3.16 is written in the Greek continuous present tense and should read, he who believes and keeps on believing has everlasting life. Do you think this is significant in the debate between whether or not a person can lose their salvation? It's a debate that, frankly, I don't want to get into, okay. if I may say that. Sure. Um, but I would say this about, what is the only way you could lose your salvation once you've accepted it? Jesus says that no one can take you out of his hand, that once you've become a Christian, you remain a Christian. But when you think about that, no one can take you out of my hand except yourself. There is a very rare case in which somebody, for whatever reasons, and we could think of some, um, decides that I no longer want to be a Christian and they turn away from the salvation. So nobody can take you out of God's hand except yourself and you can walk away on your own accord. It's an intelligent decision you make for yourself and condemn yourself then to hell for eternity. So while I don't want to get into the debate on once saved, always saved, I would say that the only way you could not be saved after receiving salvation, either it was never genuine to begin with, or you have made the conscious decision to walk away yourself. Okay, thank you very much for that, Dr. Grady. Uh, this next one's from Alwyn to say, Alwyn here, just to say what a blessing your show is and thanks to Grady for answering all the questions. Nice to see you, Grady, in the <laughs> studio. Alwyn in South Wales there, Grady. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> the next one here is saying, why did Jesus stop and tell the daughters of Jerusalem not to weep for him but for themselves? Well, I think it makes perfect sense, don't you? Mm -hmm. Jesus was simply totally obedient to the plan of God to give salvation to those who would believe in Him, through Him. Um, so if you don't accept, then you would be in a state where you should weep 
for having lost that opportunity. Thank you very much. We've got 19 minutes to go. Still lots and lots of emails. I promise you I'm going to try my hardest to get through as many as I can. Joe's written in to say, Hi, folks. Dr. Grady, when Jesus descended to Hades, 1 Peter 3.18 and preached to the dead, 1 Peter 4.6, do you think that some of the people of Noah's time were saved? It's impossible to be saved after you're dead. Uh, Paul is quite specific about that. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But before the resurrection, there was this holding area called paradise. Now, Jesus did not go to Hades. That's Gehenna hell. That's the place for those that are not believers. He did go to the underworld, but the underworld, if you'll excuse a very crude illustration, it's like a pizza pie with different slices. And so there was one place called the Lake of Fire, one place called Tartarus, one place called the Abyss, one place called Hades, and there was one place called Paradise. Again, it was not a bad place, you know, air conditioned, 55 inch flat screen TVs, lounge chairs, <laughs> you know, because by faith, those Old Testament saints were saved. And even the thief who was only there for two and a half days uh, had the same treatment that Moses had. Um, but Jesus goes there and he says, you know, comforting them, listen, you've been here 4,000 years, Adam, you know, uh, you've been here. 1,500 years, Moses. Uh, you've been here a day and a half. <laughs> but, you know, on the third day, after two and a half days there, uh, we're getting out. It's that time. I've come. This is the, the thing that you have been looking for, regardless of how long it was. And on Sunday, before the sun rises, mm -hmm. the stone is rolled away in evidence of his being resurrected in the body. And he takes the captives, as it's called, but it's more like residents of paradise. Yeah. They were captive only in the sense that they had to stay there. Um, and he sets them free by taking them to heaven. But on the way, again, some stopped glorifying God and then went on, the first fruits of his ministry. So it's not Hades. Mm -hmm. Now, he went to the underworld, but he went to the good part okay. of what was in the world before his resurrection. Uh, Peter's written in to say, good to see you both in the studio together once again. On a previous program, Dr. Grady said, Genesis 1 verse 1 could include the creation of both the natural and the supernatural. Do you believe God created the angels before he created the material universe? That's from Peter. First of all, if you'll take a look in Ezekiel, specifically dealing with Hasatan, we call him the devil, we call him Satan. Mm. His proper name is Hasatan. It means the adversary. However, if you'll take a look in Ezekiel, God says He created him perfect. Angels, including Satan, were created. Now, nothing was created prior to day one, other than we can say, well, the plan of salvation was in the mind of God before the physical universe. You know, you can argue things like that. But the angels were created on day one. And then it says that iniquity was found in him later, and I think I know why. But, but the angels are created, they're created on day one. And so in, in Christianity, we talk about three heavens, and on day three, God says the surface of the earth was heaven number one in a perfect state. This was heaven on earth, only for a very short time. Yeah. The second heaven dealing with the air and so on, and the third heaven being God's heaven. Uh, second heaven mentioned in Revelation chapter 14, verse six, mm -hmm. seven. And the third heaven, the, the prophet, well, should say the, the apostle, uh, talks about going to the third heaven. So there's three heavens. And the word in uh, Genesis chapter 1 in Hebrew for heaven is plural. It's shamayim. And so the translation should be heavens. So at the beginning, God creates time. Because if you don't have time, you've got nothing to record. Yeah. Then it says created. Uh, the verb is bara, meaning from nothing, where there was nothing previously existing, a total and complete physical vacuum. That in that he creates by speaking into existence. And the word for God is plural. It's the first reference to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Bible, the first one, Elohim. Mm. And that he created the heavens, plural, mm. the three heavens, and the earth. So he created time, space, matter, which is a scientific concept. But when it says heavens, 
yes, there's these three heavens, but it could also, in essence, be interpreted as the supernatural as well. It's included, yes, the space as we think of it in the physical realm, but also the supernatural materials as well. And that's when he creates the angels. Wow. Thank you for that explanation. Can I say what a privilege we've got Dr. Grady as part of our team with the extensive <laughs> knowledge. Wow, what a privilege it is, Grady. I, Thank I thought you. it was a privilege to have such a handsome man Thank here. You. I'll st- <laughs> yours in the control room. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Zonai's written in to say, uh, good evening, gentlemen. Um, may I ask, what did Jesus mean in the book of Matthew sixteen eighteen when he said, and I tell you that you are Peter and this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Did he mean Peter is the rock or is the revelation that he is a son of the living God, the rock that the church will build on? Thank you for a great show. That's Zonai. I love taking people to Caesarea Philippi where this particular event actually occurred. And I love putting the Bible in three dimensions. And unless you see this in three dimensions and unless you read it in the Greek, you're going to miss it completely. You see, Jesus took his disciples, walked them from Capernaum up to Caesarea Philippi. This took a couple of days. And this was the the Disney world of the ancient pagan religions. There was a cave there, the ancients called one of the gates of hell. Uh, There was a ledge with actually temples that had been built to various gods. And there was an outcrop of bedrock, which in Greek is Petra behind the temples. And at the time of Jesus, water, clear living water, literally flowed out of the entrance of the cave. And then down through a temple that had been built to Caesar Augustus, uh, because Caesars were supposed to be God at that point. But there were others. It was a temple to Pan because he was the God of water and the water coming out for that reason. Next to it, a temple to Zeus and the nymphs because they were associated with Pan. And there was a temple to the sacred goats because of Pan. There was even a dancing floor where men dressed up in goat outfits would dance in worship of Pan. Wow. And so Jesus and his disciples, being righteous Jews, would never have gone up to where the little temples actually are. That was a totally pagan area. But there were shops selling souvenirs and food and so forth, and hundreds of thousands of people per year would pilgrimage there in worship of these gods, right? Mm. So what Jesus did was he actually brought his disciples to a place where he wouldn't be contaminated by this paganism. Yes. And he turns his back to the Pool of Banias and to these little temples in the Petra, the rock bedrock behind them. And that's where this conversation occurs. And he arranges it where his back is to these, and he puts his disciples in front of him, and they are looking toward him. If they take their eyes off of Jesus, they're going to see the pagan religions of the world, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So that's the three-dimensional theater. Right. And if you read it in Greek, um, Jesus says, who do people say the Son of Man is? And some say, well, you're Elijah raised from the dead, Jeremiah, one of the other prophets, and so forth. And he says, yeah, that's what they say. Now, this is Dr. Grady's loose translation. You know. <laughs> and, and then Jesus asks one of the two most important questions in the entire New Testament. He, sa- he says, yes, that's what they say, but who do you say that I am? Mm. Peter moved to the Holy Spirit and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus commends him. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. My Father in heaven revealed that to you. And then he says this, and I say to you, you are Peter. Now, Peter's name is Petras, Mm -hmm. and with one hand he points at Peter, you are Peter, and with the other hand he points at the ground, because that's pebble. Right. Peter, you are a little pebble. You are Petras. And then Jesus says, but upon this rock, and he's using the outcrop of bedrock behind him to illustrate upon that foundational truth, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, I will build the church. He didn't say Peter would. Now, Peter was involved. Peter was a disciple. Peter was faithful. He would martyr, be martyred. And so, but Jesus is saying, Peter, you're a little pebble, but upon the bedrock truth that you have just uttered, that I am the Christ, I will build the church, not Peter. Wow. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Christine from uh, Northfleet in Kent saying, good evening. 
First time emailer. There you go. Excellent. We asked for it and we received it. And we have ask and you shall receive. Amen. (laughs) Thank you. uh, Thank you, Christine, for writing in for your very first time and welcome to the program. And please do write in every single week. Uh, This one's uh, so she's actually asking. Christine's asking. So good to see you both. Just want to say hi and thank you for your willingness to share and explain the things that people find difficult or just not clear about Christianity. What a commitment, what a love, what compassion, what an amazing channel Revelation TV is. God bless you all and all of the Revelation TV team. Love and blessings from Christine. First time emailer. God bless you. And may I say amen. (laughs) Amen to that. Lovely. And uh, we've also got an email here from James Mill. That's Jimmy. That's Nikki's dad. Ah, Grady. Yes. And he's him. saying, hi, Sire, Dr. Grady. Nikki's dad here, Jimmy. Just wanted to say, Sai, uh, good to see you again last week. And uh, Dr. Grady, so good to have met you for the first time. I just love your teaching and good to know that we have something in common, which is motorbikes. Yes. Me and Sue <laughs> are home now. Keep up the good work, Revelation TV, in the times that we are living in. Uh, need your teaching, and God bless you both. That's from Jimmy with an emoji of a motorcycle there, Grady. <laughs> so you enjoy motorcycles, do you? I did. I don't anymore <laughs> ride them, but I certainly did. It's a big Harley Davidson, was it? No, no, no. no. No, something a little smaller, but yeah. uh, equally fast. <laughs> oh, wow, wow. <laughs> Uh, this one, let's see what else we've got here. This one's from Lee. Hi, guys. Can you please ask Dr. Grady what, uh, why he thinks that although there are many double meanings to words in the Bible, i.e. sword, is not always a literal sword, but many the burning, uh, burning lakes of fire are indeed still considered literal. Can either of you explain the differences, please? Thank you for a great show. It's a good question. It is, but again, we're dealing with biblical typologies. Mm. And words don't have just one meaning. Uh, Many words have many nuances, many shades of meaning. We use the same word in many different ways. And so in biblical typology, a sword, for instance, uh, Peter cut off the ear of a guy at the time of Jesus' arrest and, and Jesus said, that's not right, put it away. Sometimes he sent his disciples and he said, take a sword with you. Other times he said, don't take a sword with you. So it depended upon the occasion, and I guess where they were going, so to speak. Um, but then we have the Word of God as the, the sword of the Spirit. Uh, and so it has both physical application and supernatural application. And we must rightly divide the Word. We must determine when the nuance deals with the supernatural and when the nuance deals with the physical. Great, I've just looked at the clock. We've got yes, six minutes I know, to go. I know. <laughs> God help us. Uh, Bernadette's written in another first time email of the great. Excellent. First Hi, time email. Welcome, 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 Bernadette. Uh, good evening, brothers. I always enjoy this program and have learned a lot from you. My question is Does God have a soul? Thank you and God bless you all at Revelation TV. Yes, God does. Remember, we are made in the image of God, but not the physical image of God. After all, God had to make both a man and a woman to give us a total revelation of his attributes, his emotions, his characteristics. So it wasn't just a man, it was a man and a woman to accomplish this. But God the Father is spirit. He doesn't have a physical body. And God only has a physical body through the incarnation and revelation of Jesus Christ. But God says, for instance, my soul will not continue to deal with sinful human beings. This is prior to the flood. When he says, I'm going to send a worldwide flood. And the soul is the intellect, the emotion, and the will. It's what you think, what you feel, how you tell your body to move around. And so God has a spirit, the Holy Spirit. Uh, God is spirit. And he has a soul because God obviously has intellect, emotion, and will. And then a body through the incarnation of Christ. And that's why we are triune beings because God is a triune being. Mm -hmm. And we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. And so obviously there's the body here, our soul, again, the intellect, the emotion, and the will, and the spirit, which is our true essence, which is within inside the body. Mm. Very good. We've got another James has written, and James Mack has written in asking about C. The Bible says there will be no more C. I believe this. What's your take on this? Well, I believe it because the Bible says it. Uh, but then again, if you think about it, we won't need a C uh, after the, the accomplishment of the end of time. And in eternity, that's not going to be a relevant thing. And so, um, again, various prophecies concerning uh, continuing to get more and more earthquakes. 
We're going to get more and more volcanic activity and so on. Um, and some of the sea, at least, the ocean will be evaporated, apparently, um, leaving only a remnant. This next one's here from uh, N in Ireland, and he's saying, uh, good evening to you both. Can you, can Dr. Grady, please answer this? When we pass, do we go straight to heaven um, and... Uh, do we go straight to heaven or hell? I don't know if that, what that, you get. Well, yes, because Paul's quite specific about this. Paul says again, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, during the last 2,000 years, if you're a believer, when you die, Paul says to be absent from the body. When the soul and spirit leave the body, you are instantaneously in the presence of the Lord. Now, the body will, will be buried properly um, and reunited later, the resurrection of the body later, united with the soul and spirit. But again, um, people don't seem to understand the concept of hell. Uh, remember, Jesus said that I'm going away and I'm going to prepare a place for you, for the believers. That's called heaven. Well, hell is a bad place, let me tell you. However, think about it. If you can't go to heaven, you've got to go somewhere. Mm. So God pro provides a place called hell for the unbeliever to go. Because once you, you have become a human at conception, you have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Now, the body gets bigger, but the soul and the spirit remain there. And so you have an eternal nature. From now on, you will have an eternal nature. The question becomes, will it be with God in heaven? And if it's not, he provides another place for you to reside. And that's what's how we call hell. Let's see if we can squeeze this in. We've got about two minutes to go, Grady. Yeah, and uh, Tony's written in saying, is hell located in the center of the earth? First of all, nobody can actually know that. We, we tend to talk about the underworld. And when we read things like uh, when Jonah dies and goes to paradise temporarily and then is resurrected, uh, we're talking about going down below the roots of the mountains. And so we get that concept. Now, I would say as a scientist, there is nothing contradictory about the natural and supernatural occupying the same place. So is it in the earth? I don't think so. Um, I don't know where it is, uh, and it may be. I'm not trying to say it isn't. We get the idea of going down, and again, below the roots of the mountains, with the concept that hell is in the earth. But it's a supernatural place. It doesn't necessarily have to be there. Grady, you're going to be leaving us shortly and going back home to the States. Are they well, going to uh, have the Q&A show by Skype? I certainly think so. We will, we will. But it's, I, I'm only here at the invitation of Revelation. Oh, so, bless you. You know, when they invite me, I say yes, if oh. I can. <laughs> Amen. And it's been an absolute privilege having you with us. Um, why don't you just finish this program with some inspirational words for our viewers tonight who are watching? Well, uh, one of the inspirational words that we shared on our morning was from Psalm 118, verses 22 to 24. You know, this is the day the Lord has made. You shall rejoice in it. That, that joy is not situational. It's not circumstantial. Happiness is situational and circumstantial, but joy is not. And we are to rejoice. Mm -hmm. Now, people sometimes don't understand what the word rejoice. They think they know what it means, but just to kind of clarify it, it means to have joy and then have it again, such as turn and return. Mm. So it's to have joy and then to have joy again. And so this is the day the Lord has made. You are to rejoice in it regardless of situation and circumstances, regardless of whether there's war in the Ukraine yes. or war in the Sudan or wherever it may be. Yes. We will always have troubles. You know, Jesus said, you know, everybody's going to have troubles. Yeah. You can't avoid it. Yeah. But it's how you deal with it that is exactly. important. I want to say a big thank you on behalf of all of Revelation TV, the team, the family, and all our viewers. It's been an absolute privilege having you with us in the studio, Grady. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I do look forward to being invited back. <laughs> Amen to that. We'll hopefully see you soon. A big thank you to all our viewers. So many emails came in tonight. I'm so sorry. I just want to acknowledge at least uh, Ken and Anita and Dylan and Peter and Georgia and Mark, uh, Marilyn, uh, Shireen, James, Les, um, and so many more. So sorry we didn't get to read out all your emails, but so much information being shared tonight. RevelationTV.com slash videos. May the Lord Heavenly Father bless you today. God bless. Bye-bye.